I've colored it. And such a difference is called a SNP, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism. So in this sample of chromosomes, there we go. Uh, there's a SNP position right here. Some people have yellow, some people have blue. Yellow, blue, 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 yellow. There's a second SNP position just before the bed. It's a red, green SNP. Roughly, if we look at a pair of human chromosomes, we'll find such a difference every thousand bases. So we're only showing here the differences among the chromosomes where uh, there are solid lines, it means everybody's the same. But about every thousand bases will find this difference. Now notice these chromosomes over time break and reform. So if I know this, this allele is blue, sometimes this one is green, but on the other chromosome sometimes it's red. So these have been continually broken and reformed, and the relations along the chromosome get randomized. Now, bingo, here's a new mutation, and it's favorable. It makes its bearer better. It has increased fitness. If it's a sickly gene, the person who's carrying it has 20% more children than others do. When you start iterating that 20% over time and pretty soon, there's a whole lot of copies of this new, uh, new version. It's swept. It's gotten to very high frequency very rapidly. And it has gotten there so fast that this shuffling that happens of crossing over hasn't had time to break up the chromosome. So every time you see the new one, this red, it's on a chromosome that's blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, red, blue, blue, red, red, blue. They're all the same because they all have a very recent common ancestry. And so it's pretty easy with our computer to scan the human genome and look for this pattern where some mutant is associated with a long region of what's called linkage to sequel memory. So when I'm talking about sweeps and scanning for sweeps, it's searching for exactly this pattern. I'm going to talk in a moment about uh, um, a mutant that many of us carry that keeps a gene turned on that ordinarily we turn off that makes lactase, which lets you digest milk sugar. And if we look at that region of the human genome in Europe, uh, the region that is homogeneous like this is a million bases. A million bases. It's happened so fast. It's spread so fast. Uh, that, that there's about a million base length where the whole chromosome, part of the chromosome is the same and it's, you can't miss that. Well, back to this issue of whether or not uh, human evolution is sped up. Um, when should you have rapid evolution? <clears throat> well, Fisher, like so much else in biology, came up with the hypothesis or the idea that what gets you rapid evolution is a large population. Because the bigger the population, the more targets there are for mutation. And a good one, the one that's going to be favored, is going to be extremely rare. There is ample experimental configuration of this, uh, go to a pest control company and ask them what the waiting time until uh, tolerance to an insecticide is, and it is almost perfectly inversely proportional to the area you treat. 
the bigger the area you treat, the faster resistance shows up, the faster tolerance shows up, simply because every different bug is a potential experiment in having a favorable mutation. And the more bugs, the uh, faster tolerance shows up. Uh, the other factor, the other cause of more rapid evolution is a change in the environment. Any change in the environment uh, leads to new and different selection pressures. Um, humans qualify in both these accounts. After we started farming, human numbers went up by a factor of between 100 and 1,000. Um, so if we think of evolution 10,000 years ago, uh, we're treating an acre with insecticide, think that way. Uh, today we're treating 1,000 acres. And thousand times as many times. What seems to happen in these cases of a changed environment initially is that there will be some genetic system that produces chemical X and you're better off with a little bit less of X. If you're better off with a little bit less of X then a broken version of X has an advantage and sweeps. Then you have to ask, what's the probability that if one broken X is good for you, that two broken Xs will be even better for you? And again, Fisher worked on problems like that. It's not very great. It's not very great. We know lots of cases where one copy of broken X is is good for you in the sense of it increases your fitness. Uh, two copies, not so good. Sickle cell anemia is a famous example. Um, and there are others. Here again is what I'm talking about. This is one chromosome in 14 people. In other words, we all have 23 pairs. This is one pair in 14 people. And they're all making a normal gene product. Mutation breaks a copy, so this carrier has higher fitness. This person has a lot more children. And pretty soon this gene is swept. It's at a pretty high frequency. Great, everybody's better off. But pretty soon it gets so common that people show up with two copies of the broken. And they lose. They don't have any fitness, or they have very low fitness. And so this march of the yellow version stops the minute it starts showing up in two copies. And this can result in an equilibrium where selection maintains both of them. We know a lot of cases of this in humans, and we know lots of cases domestic animals. In both cases, we were in recently changed environments. And I think we're in, a, in a, lots of indications we're in a kind of transient state. That eventually, this green mutation is going to show up, and this green is the best of both worlds, and it's going to sweep. So the, this is called a balanced polymorphism, we know about a lot of them, and vet veterinarians know about them, farmers know about them. We don't know about them in wild animals. They just don't seem to be there. If you're in an environment for a long enough time, it's as if natural selection has time, and this is a band-aid, natural selection has time to, to get it right. So a lot of balanced polymorphism seem to be a signature of a, an environmental change. Has, has any evidence or research been done on invasive species? You, you, you remember because you've had a class from you and I'm mostly deaf, so yell at me. Has there been any evidence on invasive species or any research on invasive plants as far as... Well, plants or, or animals or insects 
uh, can obey the same kind of dynamics as genes. Uh, a common pattern is an invasive plant will show up and it'll sort of hang around the docks for a number of years. And then all of a sudden, the invasion happens. But it seems that it takes that plant a while to, to adapt to its new environment. Um, there was just quite a big paper on this published about invasive plants in Australia. And they're the same species, but they're, most of them are half or a third the size in Australia. And it took them a while to sort of evolve a smaller size and then, then boom. Well, <clears throat> there's a, a, a gene, a, a chemical called myostatin, that suppresses muscle growth. And if your myostatin is broken, you end up looking like a puffed up version of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Especially if you're a Belgian blue beef cow. Now that cow has got broken myostatin and it's absolutely grotesque. But if you're a rancher, that cow is, you look at that and you see dollar bills. Because one cow without much more food produces twice as much meat as a regular Belgian flu. <clears throat> now, it's, you might imagine it's not very good meat. It's kind of McDonald's grade. There's no marbling. What fat there is is just under the skin. <clears throat> but the actual meat is just <clears throat> pure red, no fat in it at all. I wouldn't want to eat one, but I suspect that if I go to McDonald's in Europe, I eat plenty of them. Uh, well, that is a very successful animal because it's been selected by ranchers for this grotesque beef production. Uh, it would never make it in a world without veterinarians. This uh, Mutation distorts the um, birth canal, or the, the birth architecture of females. The calves aren't super big. Females have an awful time giving birth, and they need cesareans. So if you're a rancher with a lot of Belgian blues, your vet bills are high because of the cesareans. But when you take that guy to the slaughterhouse and have him weighed, uh, you make up big time. Same mutation. Here, this is a whippet, which is a small greyhound. It's a racing dog. But you get a better whippet, and you get a winner if he's got one copy of this broken myostatin. And so this is what you want, but just like with those yellow, that yellow mutant, once there's uh, enough broken ones around, you end up with animals with two copies of broken myostatin. And they're crippled and grotesque. Right. So this is this is a balanced polymorphism in uh, in whippets, regular whippet, a bully whippet, in a freak. Uh, this is in uh, beef cattle, and actually this is this is a human born with broken myostatin. Uh, his mom 